Coming to you live from all the way across the pond, <laughs> our friend Lynn Diefenbach. Lynn, what are you going to do today? Well, I'm going to talk about crashing waves today um, and getting motion and action into your painting, into your pastel painting. Um, I'm also going to show some underpainting to make it a bit faster. So I'm going to be working in the way in which I would do uh, en plein air. Uh, since we're all talking on plein air stuff. Uh, seems, and seems to be the thing to talk about these days. <laughs> so, all right. Sorry, well, are you ready to teach or you want to get your camera set up? What do you need to do? No, we're, all, we're all set to go. Okay, let's do it. Let's do it. All, all right. right. <laughs> well, it looks like I've almost finished my painting, but I haven't. Uh, what I've done here. It's pastel. I'm working on Lux Archival, white Lux Archival paper, which I rather like. Um, and I've got down a base colour of the pastel. It's very, very brief. You can still see a lot of the paper through it. But I did this. It would have only taken me five minutes at the most. And now I'm going to liquefy it with some solvent. Um, you can use gamsol, you can use any kind of uh, uh, solvent. Some people use alcohol, but then uh, then uh, people would say, oh, well, that's a waste. But in, in my case, I'm going to use some artist solvent. And the reason for that is just to get a better coverage, get a nice face down. Uh, and it saves a bit of time, especially working on white. So I'll just get to, I've got a, a nice little uh, square flat watercolour brush. And not right. that I would do this, this flat, but I'm going to do it upright and I'm going to liquefy the pastel. Um, you may, uh, some people might do this in watercolour, some might do it even a little like case of acrylic. But in my case, I like to do it in pastel because then I'm presenting a pure pastel um, with no other mixed media in there. So I'm just fluffing it around and Getting all that. You can also, at this stage, uh, you'll, I'll be able to, especially around in the wave area itself, but first of all, before I get really dirty solvent, I've just put a bit of warmth in along the horizon line for some clouds. Uh, I what, what, did you, what, did you put, what did you put to create some warmth? Did you have some warm pastel in there? I didn't see it. Yes, I had. Yeah, no, you would probably wouldn't have seen that. A slightly apricotty colour. Apricotty. Uh, <laughs> apricotty. <laughs> but I don't know. It's a uh, well. It'd be a uh, like a cadmium red orange, the lightest value thereof. So it just adds that warmth in along the horizon line. I'm going to have a few clouds in there, um, and it's so one it's part of your intent to soften the edges there. Uh, no, the the intent is just to have a slightly warmer colour at the horizon line because in okay. uh, in size it is lighter along the horizon line in general in general and then uh, at, um, in the sky and then as we come to the sea it's darker out there and comes progressively lighter as the uh, as the sea becomes closer to shore um, but I I just do always put in something along the horizon line. Sometimes it is more yellow than uh, than having little bits of red in. But of course, with uh, if you put it too yellow, you've got to be careful that you don't create a hailstorm coming uh, because it'll go green when you put it near the blue. Um, so I just like that little bit of warmth along there. Um, here, we, here I'm just, I have put in some greys, um, a few little touches of green into this side of the cloud. The sunlight is coming this way and hitting in particular the masses there. So I've left them white and I'm just, I can soften these edges in and that'll be really helpful for when I come to put the dry pastel on over the top. So it, in essence, you might say, oh, well, you've painted your painting by the time I finish. But no, I have. I have a question for you, Lynn. I'm yeah. Sorry. 
Yeah. Okay, so walk me through what you're going to do in the next few minutes because we're going to get this thing started. But tell me what's about to happen. What's about to happen that is that this whole um, uh, scene will be set with it'll all the pastel will be liquefied. It'll be dry by the time I'm, I'm ready to start, and then I'm going to get into the actual pasteling. Okay, so this is acting like an underpainting, and then you're going to take that and turn it into a fuller, more complete painting. Is that right? That's exactly right. Yeah, this is speeding okay. up the process. Speeding up the process. Okay, well, let's get the show officially started. Let's go. It's Art School Live with Eric Rose. Now, here's your host. Eric Rhodes! Hey there, welcome to Art School Live. I'm Eric Rhodes, and I'm glad, really glad to be here with you today. Thank you for tuning in. We have Lynn Diefenbach coming to us all the way from across the pond. Uh, we'll talk to her about that and exactly where she is. Uh, but this is going to be a great lesson. She's a fabulous pastel artist, and you're going to learn a little bit about pastel painting today and some unique approaches to it. Uh, she's going to be doing an underpainting, and then she's going to go further and do a complete painting. So you'll learn about that. And Lynn, of course, is an incredible master. So we uh, I'll show you a couple of her paintings just so you can get a feel for what she is capable of doing. She is amazing. She's a really sweet person, too. I got a chance to spend uh, about a week with her uh, when she was here in Austin, Texas. And... Um, we really had a lot of fun when she was shooting uh, her art instruction video, which we'll tell you about in a few minutes. Anyway, Lynn is our guest. We have a, a winner from our last broadcast, and that is, oh, this is actually today's prize, uh, the easel brush clip. You can clip it onto your easel. And all you got to do to win is put a comment in the comments section, and we'll grab from the comments both on live and replay, and, and maybe you'll be the winner. The winner of the book uh, from our broadcast yesterday is J.M. Hansen in Wisconsin. So, Jam, we're going to hear from you soon. Uh, thank you for doing that. We have a free gift for you today, and that is uh, 45 pastel pointers from the pros. Uh, just go to pastellive.com slash 45 trips. Trips, not trips, tips. Hello. Uh, anyway, pastellive.com slash 45 tips. And, of course, you can subscribe to this program. We've been here every day since COVID began. Um, and uh, there are hundreds of broadcasts on YouTube. Uh, we'd like you to subscribe. That helps our YouTube numbers. If you go to YouTube, look us up at Art School Live and hit the subscribe button. Of course, give us a follow on social media too. Give me a follow. That would be terrific. Okay, now back to Lynn Diefenbach. Okay, Lynn, take it away. Okie dokie. Well, here's the, uh, the finished product of underpainting. So I've That just took no time at all. I know it took no time at all because I had a spare up my sleeve. No, <laughs> no, it just it, it meant that it was dry. But it, in reality, it only takes uh, a few minutes to dry, especially when you're out on plein air. So I've liquefied it. There's still plenty of white paper there, but uh, I have got rid of most of it. So now I can just take my dry pasta uh, and go in and start working my way around uh, completing it. So, so tell me... Tell me why someone would want an underpainting and also talk to us about how you're holding your pastel. Okay. Well, the, the, the whole point of the underpainting is to speed it up, speed up the process on white paper in particular. I could do it without the underpainting, um, but it would just take a little bit longer because you've got to fill in all the white dots of the paper. So this is speeding it up. It also means that you can, if you miss pieces of, uh, in your painting, it doesn't matter because you've got that work underneath anyway. And literally it doesn't take very long at all to do. Um, so I found, I found that in working on plein air in particular, or if I'm having to demonstrate, I can speed up my process by doing it. Um, and so I found it very, very useful. Now I'm holding my pastel between my two uh, fingers and the thumb. That means so I'm using basically an inch um, paintbrush because I'm painting with pastel. I'm not drawing with it. I'm not 
using the pointers. So I'm painting with the pastel. I've got this lovely broad um, piece of pastel that I can uh, just wave around like a brush. So the beauty of pastel, of course, is that it's more spontaneous in many ways and more immediate um, than anything else because you can just pick up your, your beautiful sticks of colour and off you go. Um, and the blending happens up on the paper itself. Now I'm getting to, and I'm just warming up along the horizon line there, but that becomes too apricot. So then I can glaze over it with the blue that I've already used and just fluff it around a bit with my finger um, and settle it in. So it's just so easy to do. It's the perfect media, in fact, for en plein air, apart from watercolour, I guess. Um, but I find that pastel is so uh, very, very good. Uh, you only have to carry a few sticks. You don't have to carry mega amounts of, of pastel to... So when you're um, outdoors, when you're outdoors, yeah. how many do you... How, do you carry a big box, a little box? What's that look like? Uh, I carry a little box, so what would be a um, backpack-sized box. But within that, I can I can have oh, a few hundred pastels if I wanted to. But I try to keep it minimal so that I don't, um, you know, I, I can always adapt my processes with just a you know ten pastels. Lynn, really. just just for the benefit of people who tuned in late, Julia is asking, uh, what did you use for underpainting? Use pastel for underpainting, dry pastel that I then uh, liquefied with a solvent uh, that can be Gamsol. I know that you guys over there use a lot of Gamsol. Uh, it's not so readily acceptable here, but I used uh, um, an artist out of solvent. But anything, anything that will dissolve. You can actually use water too, but that takes longer to, um, to dry, of course, and the whole point is to get down quick and be able to uh, move on and get into your painting. Um, and will you tell us real quickly where you are today because people want to know. Okay, where am I today? I'm in Australia. I uh, live on the east coast of Australia, right at the uh, doorstep of the Great Barrier Reef. Um, I'm about 200 metres, no, maybe 400 metres from the sea. And I'm in a little place called Yipoon. And uh, I've been, I was born here, raised here, went away, came back. So I'm very privileged to live in this area. Love it. I'm going to get I'm over gonna... there one day. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to take up, I'm going to sleep on your couch. <laughs> You're very welcome. Baby. <laughs> <laughs> I know I am. You told me before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, uh, I, um, I have the great privilege of traveling the world doing what I do. And uh, and it's just a wonderful place to come home to, I can tell you that. Jocelyn now, says, I've heard that some people use vodka to blend the underpainting. Well, <laughs> some people do. Now, I don't drink, but uh, people who do drink say, oh, well, why would you? <laughs> what a waste. You, yeah. it, <laughs> um, you would start a lot of rumors in your small town if you started going to the liquor store. Yeah, that's right. Mind you, when I was uh, over in Switzerland, and I didn't, of course, you can't carry the solvent with you, uh, and I, so I went to the pharmacy and I said, can I have some pure alcohol, please? Um, because I knew that they would have some. And they looked at me and I said, no, no, I'm not going to drink it. I need it for painting, please. <laughs> uh, so they, they, at great expense, I got this pure alcohol. Um, now, I'm working my way down through this little area. I'm going to uh, whack in a, a couple of nice little brights just to key it up a slight amount close into where the real froth and bubble and stuff happen. And just to soften it because that's very air, there's lots of spray back there. Um, and that, just by running your finger across in that way, you can just soften it off um, and uh, and then go back and put a few little tips here and there of 
the way of coming forward, getting the action One of the, in. Another benefit to the underpainting is that you can put lighter on top of darker or darker on top of lighter and create that sense of um, That's right. different, yeah. different yes. colors, different depth. Yeah. And it's already got its base down, so, you know, we're in a good position uh, there. Okay, so I can move on forward and uh, come into the next layer, which has more light in it. It has got a wee touch of uh, a um, oh, know, brown kind of colour, ochre kind of colour. So I'm going to put that in just to get the next layer. This becomes a little bit lighter. But I'm thinking about foam holes too, so I'm doing a, a squiggly, scribbly kind of action. Um, always got to do squiggles and wiggles, but um, that just gives that illusion of action. I'll come along with not most, not pure white. I'm going for a grey look. Now, the, the whole... Uh, way of getting, of um, dealing with your lights is really important. What sort of light are they? Uh, it's not necessarily a pure white. And people go for a pure white. Well, I want to reserve my pure white for back here in this big spot. That's where the pure white needs to be. But back in this area behind the main event, I'm going to get in just some little touches of light. It's a real uh, wash basin there in that area. Um, so, but there has to be some rhyme or reason. Here's the, I'm darkening as I come into a little patch a bit closer in here. It's not going to be as dark as back there at the horizon line. So I put it down quite dark, at quite a little bit darker than it should be but I can always take it back. Now, in general with pastels, you do work from uh, dark to light in general, unlike watercolour where you work from light to dark. Oh, the other way around. Yeah, no, that's the way back. Sorry. It's 3 a.m. Well, some people do it. Some people, like Barbara Tapp, she goes dark to light. Some people yeah. do it the opposite. Yeah, you can. You can go back and forth. And there's no reason, you know, you haven't created the greatest sin on earth by... I'm um, getting your lights down to it. But I would always prefer, I find that there's a bit more control to go um, from darks and brights through to lights. And, uh, and I find that it's a little bit easier to control in that way. So we have a question from Susan who asks, uh, why is the horizon so dark? Uh, it's probably darker in um, the photo there, but it is dark. The further out you go, the deeper the sea out on the horizon line, it is darker than as you come forward. And that right. creates a sense of aerial perspective. Now, I could just settle off some of that, but in general, I like it, a nice dark area there. And then at the okay. bottom of the sky, it tends to be lighter near the horizon line. And as you go up into the sky, you'd be going from uh, cerulean to cobalt to French ultramarine. And that creates what's called aerial perspective or the sense of the sky, the distance, um, the distance going out to the uh, horizon line and then the sky coming up over you. Um, so it's all optical illusion stuff. Now, coming into this main wave here, I'm going to get in uh, a little bit more of my um, grey kind of aspect. And this How do you try to make that? Is that a cool grey or warm grey? It's a little hard to tell. It's a Just... yellow grey. It is a warmer okay. grey than cool. Yep. Uh, we can put a little swatch here. So can you can you see this swatch? Yeah, it should be able to see that spot. Yeah. yeah. So that one, as opposed to here's a different, um, it's all, it is a bluey grey. Uh, so this has got a bit more red in it. And I like that juxtaposed against the green in particular being complementary. And what I'm doing 
is uh, wanting to create volume to this great big splot. Uh, so I need to be um, cognizant of the fact that the light, sunlight's coming this way, but I don't want the lightest light at the very edge because that will flatten it out. We've got this rounded form, and if you want things to turn around the corner, it has to be slightly darker going around there, but the, the lightest area here, because it's pulling forward and, and making a rounded shape, and then as we go around the corner, it's going into your mid values, into the dark shadow on this side here. Okay, um, mm -hmm. the side I might just smooth out a little bit so I don't have that grainy effect. And uh, a few more little bits and pieces of this uh, this warm grey. I actually don't talk in warms and cools, Eric. I talk in red, blue, yellow, um, which is something that I find is. Um, it's something that I learned with Dan Mr. Daniel E. Green in 1999. And, uh, and Mr. Green uh, always talked in terms of red, blue, yellow. And I find that that is easier to recognize than whether it's warm or, or cool. And so he, you're saying that he always thought of things as red or yellow? Red, blue, or yellow. Red, blue, yeah. or yellow, okay. Yeah, red, blue, or yellow. So you'd look at a colour and think, oh, well, it's leaning more towards a red, say. Uh, and then you would look at that red and think, well, what type of red is it? Is it a yellow red or a blue red? And then you'd further break it down. Was it a, uh, a an intense bright, which meant um, either it was a, uh, the purest pigment or it had, uh, you know, just two colours together, say a red and a yellow? Or if it was slightly browny, then it had an element of all three in, but leaning more towards one than the other. Um, well, we have the pleasure of, of you have coming up in May. Uh, your art instruction video is coming out, and you're going to go into a lot of depth about those things. So I won't trouble you with it right now, but it's exciting that that's going to be coming. Yeah, that is very exciting. <laughs> It seems you that like all, you it, came all the way across the pond to shoot it. Yeah, yeah no, it, there I was in Austin, Texas. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> One day I was in Japan, the next day I was in Austin. <laughs> Having a lovely time. Okay, so I've now got those colors in. I could also, if I wanted to, bring in some a little bit of um, sky kind of grays if I wanted to just uh, I'll lighten that off. I might use the green actually. Just lighten off what I've got there. And I want that definite weight of shadow that comes along the back here. Like so. I will get more lights in beyond, but I'm just holding fire until I see what happens here. I think I've got enough down to now get into my uh, the splot itself. So let's go for that. I'm taking up, this is a an art spectrum. It's a, if I remember correctly, is a warm, they call it a warm white, and you won't see it when I put it up there, but you will see it when I go here. Actually, it's lemon yellow by the look of it, um, but it's a tinted white which is rather nice because then you don't have to go directly uh, to a really cold titanium white or something like that. Now, as I, the, the lemon yellow just gives a bit more umpa into our, uh, into the colour. Now, I'm leaving some of the underpainting to come through because it does its work to start creating these nice little um, variations, volumes, spreads, sprays into our wave itself. As we go out, I'll just soften the edge. And the spray is not going to be dit, 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 dit. That's just dit, 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 dit. 
what I want to do is just with a, the lightest pressure of hand, I'm going to just start taking that out. Then I'm going to soften it off. Then I might put a few little dibs and dobs. I can make that little bunch a bit stronger. And I'm wanting to make sure I cross the centre line of my painting. I don't want to finish it halfway because we all know that, you know, you don't want to stick things halfway, uh, a definite division halfway because you will divide your painting in half. And, uh, and then I've got to soften the edge here. Just spray, spray, spray. And then through here I can make a few little dancy marks. And so you can... Okay. You you think spray and you do spray. I have some more questions for you. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Somebody is asking, uh, Francesca is asking what paper you're using. Yeah, I'm working on Lux Archival. It's a pure, it's a pure white paper. Um, and it's, it's a very sanded uh, tooth. So you need to put enough pastel down before you touch it, otherwise you bleed. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you feel literally bleed <laughs> if you don't it. cover it if you're going to touch the door with your hand some people won't do that but I, I like to give it a bit of pride Carl ask a question do you keep some color pastel in multiple tip variations or just let the pastel shape out as you go I just let it shape out as I go and if I need to do a fine line, well, then I find an edge. I just it, just look at it and think, oh, yeah, there's the edge, and I'll go to view. And I can draw a very, very fine line by finding uh, the edge of the pastel, if want, if need be. But in general, I will use the broad side of the pastel. Um, I want to paint with it. Uh, but, of course, sometimes you just need to do a line. But the line I wouldn't do like this. I would do a line on the side like this or like that, mm. okay? And yeah. uh, and you can make a very fine mark of the pastel just by your pressure of hand. Now, coming into our, our big spot here, soften the edge and we get onto that nice shadow area. And I'll get, I'll find that shadow by the light behind. So instead of uh, doing, just putting more dark in, I'm going to find it by using my negative space, the space around, to um, to patch the shadow out. Again, soften edge because the spray, all of that spray. The way to do spray, of course, everything has to be soft uh, because it's diffused. So um, look, I've got two eyes in there. Look at that. And the more you look at it, the more you see two eyes. So, okay. And I've got an eyeball in there. Once you start looking for animals and things, you will find them in your, in your pasta painting. I'm going to just lighten up or in your painting full stop. Oh, by the way, too, I do paint with oils. Um, I'm a, an oil painter as well. And I approach my oil, oils almost in the same way as I do my pasta, in the same manner. Um, so nothing, nothing different. I find that uh, pasta is at least a little bit quicker. Because you don't have to mix anything, you just do it on the paper. Do you, my, do you uh, ever use oil sticks? I don't. I don't. Um, no. Um, I've just never got around to using them or experimenting with them, I guess. Um, I Hello, think Paris. Had... Sorry? Hey, you guys, tell us in the comments where you're watching from. We'd love to hear from you. Hello, Paris. <laughs> Hello, Paris. Love Paris. So here we go down into this area here. Again, I don't want the uh, the white right at the edge, but I'll I'll uh, 
look at that once I get there. Um, I, I just putting some nice little darks in there. I'll uh, get a few more bits and pieces coming in here. All that little wash that's happening back there. And they, they've got to be um, planted in, what I would call planted in, not just uh, on the whole, not just floating on top. We want this sort of sense of movement, action, touches of light back in there, but not too much in here, perhaps. And um, coming forward here, a little bit of a roll along, but I'm not going to put on so much. I'm not pressing, pressing as heavily as I am in front. Okay. So that's coming along. There's a nice sense of movement and action. And I'm thinking about the way of coming in, hitting this rock, exploding up to the I air. I like the sound effects. You like the sound effects? Yes. Yeah. Everyone thinks yeah, I do that I too. I make sound effects when I'm painting. <laughs> Everyone thinks I should write a dictionary of art terms because <laughs> that, that would be one of them. You know, whack and walk. Pressing heavier to do to deliver more if I want a more solid mark. Dribble. Think, dribble, do, dribble, speak, dribble, all of that stuff. So what are you going to be doing next? Are you going to work on the rocks up in front or are they pretty much yeah, where you I'm want to be? I'm going to do the rocks next. So it's time okay. to do that. I can come back um, and, uh, and, and finish that off once I've set the rocks in place. Okay, right. so. So why don't, we, why don't we do this? Lynn, let's take a break. Get okay. yourself a glass of water. And uh, yep. we'll be back in just a, in about just a minute. All right. Sound like okay. a plan? Terrific. There's a plan. Okay. All right. Our guest today is Lynn Diefenbach. She's coming to you live from Australia. I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher of Plant Air and Fine Art Connoisseur Magazine, plus a bunch of other things. Uh, we're here every weekday at 12 noon, and you can subscribe just by going to YouTube and looking up Art School Live. And that's where you find us, right? And you should subscribe when you're there. Okay, I want to tell you about a couple of things. First off, if you want to experience Lynn Dief Diefenbach, um, she's coming to the Plein Air Convention. Whoa. Yep, she's coming all the way over to the Plein Air Convention, Great Smoky Mountains, and it's going to be phenomenal. We're going to hang out. Anyway, uh, come join us. Uh, we have five stages. We have a pastel stage, watercolor stage, a main stage, and then we have what we call the demo stage, and then we have another demo stage. So we've got a lot of stuff going on where we talk about all the different mediums and demos from a lot of different people. So that is coming up. Great Smoky Mountains. Be a chance to meet Lynn. Not easy to get over to her, right? Where she is. She's also going to be on, on Plein Air Live uh, coming up, so you don't want to miss that. Uh, speaking of that, watch this. It has made the difference in my world. I get invigorated. Today was just fantastic. I love it. It's just brilliant. I mark it off on my calendar. It was amazing. I need the community. I always wanted to go to art school. I feel like this could be it. The amount of value that is delivered is incomparable. When I did your first plein air live, I was only breaking into plein air, and that just opened up my world. Every day I say, this is the best day, and again, it's another best day. <laughs> I'm taking notes, I'm watching what people are doing. I really am very grateful for the opportunity to just look over the shoulders of these great artists. It has taught me not only better plein air, it has made me a better studio painter as well. You know, the lineup is just so amazing. Thank you for introducing all these wonderful new artists to me. Everyone you have on here is fabulous. You learn something from every single teacher every single time, and it's just brilliant. 
has made the last three years really bearable. Somebody like me really can't get to a convention. You know, this is really special. I need people to paint with, even though we're not all physically together. But then the relationships that are formed, I think that's what's really long lasting. It's just really fun to, to see people that you've, you've become friends with, you know, throughout the years. There's always something to learn, no matter how many years you've been painting or if, if you're a very beginner. It has exceeded my expectations and I've already signed up for next year. This is my second year and I definitely signed up for next year. This is my fifth live event. I was so happy. I went for it. You know, this is really special. Epic! It's going to be epic. Plein Air Live is going to be epic. Just saying. We need to go. I uh, I accidentally did that wrong, though. I said Lynn was going to be on Plein Air Live. She's going to be on Pastel Live and uh, not Plein Air Live, but maybe we'll have her on Plein Air Live one, one year or two. Anyway, she's coming up to the Plein Air Convention, too, and I should mention that the price goes up on Valentine's Day. Uh, you want to get in and get that done uh, because we're running out of seats and because there's this battle east versus west, who's going to win that tug of war? Don't know yet. But anyway, Lynn's going to be there. Lynn, we're excited about having you in uh, the Smoky Mountains. Oh, look, I can't wait. Um, I've been having so much fun getting out on plein air here in Australia because I thought after you asked me, I thought, oh, gee, I better go home and practice <laughs> being on plein air. But uh, so, uh, I just so I've actually fallen in love with my own area all over again. Um, I love going out and I paint casarinas and I paint Livestonia palms and I paint um, all uh, mangroves and seascapes and oh, and I agree with whoever it was on your uh, little caption there um, that it improves your studio work out of sight. Um, and so I've re been really enjoying the fruits of my labours of going out on plein air and then coming back into the studio and, uh, and, and finding um, new approaches and understanding of what I'm looking at, uh, especially if you're working from photographs. Um, so now Makes I've been... Huge, huge difference. Makes a huge difference. The other thing I've been doing, Eric, is um, is journaling and uh, visual diary kind of thing, uh, and having so much fun um, drawing from life, taking taking my journal out with me on on site and drawing from life, uh, then writing about writing poems and all kinds of weird and wonderful things. Having so much fun. I went to uh, Switzerland and Uganda this year. Oh, last year, sorry, and uh, and um, Uganda in particular. Yeah, I was drawing elephants from life. <laughs> oh my! Well, you're doing a big uh, you're doing a big retreat in Switzerland in October. Yeah, How yeah, cool. going going back to Switzerland, and uh, I, I'm going to be over there about that time. Maybe I'll just uh, figure oh, out yeah. how to slip out of. I'm, I'm doing a fine art connoisseur trip to Venice, and Venice isn't far from Switzerland. Oh, when's that? When's that? I don't know. What, what date October. is that? October, yeah. We haven't put um, all the all the details out yet. Okay, yeah. Oh, Switzerland. Um, Venice is wonderful. I love Venice. Uh, but I love Switzerland too. The, the place that I'm going to is um, one of the most traditional villages in um, Switzerland, and it's right in the foothills of the Swiss Alps. So you climb the Alps and you're looking over the hill at the Rhine River <laughs> or over the mountain. Um, and uh, and it's just a, a phenomenally beautiful place, um, very inspirational. And so I was writing poems uh, of all kinds and drawing en plein air 
and uh, just finding it, in, it, it added to the flavour of what I was doing. In the meantime, back at the farm here, I'm darkening, I've taken my darks, and these are, these are delicious Terry Ludwig darks. Um, and this is the colour, this one here, it's a, a very deep violet. It looks, it'll look black up there if I put it over here, it'll still look black. Uh, but it is a deep violet. Um, and because it's been liquefied underneath, it has lightened it off a little bit. So I can come back with my uh, straight colour again and cut this out, but leave, if Ken, if you could bring it right in here, we might be able to see the variation. No, you can't. But when I'm looking at this with my eye, with where I am, I can see that there's a slighter, lighter variation amongst the darks. So what I'm able to do amongst the darks, I'm able to create the variation of values in that dark area just by leaving some of the underpainting doing its stuff. And uh, so that's very, very helpful. And, and basically, uh, that's that rock completed. I've just dragged a little bit of uh, dark in a, um, a glazing manner a hit and miss manner and leaving little dribbles coming through on the rock. Um, I've left my underpainting doing its work on these rocks just by going back and putting the darks in. I could just put a wee touch more dark along here to create a few little ledges. While I've got the dark in my hand, I might put some in over here. So I'll do, I'll, I'll jump all over the place now to um, use the dark while it's in my hand. I'll pop some in here just to create. Now, this is a very dark dark, but it's not going to stay like this. I'm going to knock it back with uh, subsequent layers of colour, but it will provide the depth of colour, depth of value um, that I'm chasing in the meantime. These oysters and so on and so forth up here, I'm going to put a wee touch of, of a green, of an olive green through there, and even maybe a bit of blue just to bring the ocean in on my rock, like so. Very brief. Bit of shadow down in here shadow which will make sense once I start putting the froth and bubble in. Uh, through this area here we've got a change of temperature of colour or type of colour. This one's more of a Prussian kind of bluey green and I want to set in place this wash basin kind of action through here, through here. I can glaze in over some of the redness of the rock, again, bringing moisture and water onto, uh, uh, onto the rocks because, I mean, they're underneath the slot. They're getting the spray all over them. So we want to make sure that they look wet. This is a lovely area through here, particularly nice. It's the wash basin area. Um, they're the bits that get me really excited in that wash base and dribbles over rocks and so on and so forth. So I, this, this action that I'm doing here is just thinking about the way in which the water is, uh, is travelling through. I'm creating passages or what, or other, in other words, lead-ins into my painting. So I'm going to be able to travel in here, crash around through there disappear out here and then come back and do it all again. So um, lead-ins uh, are really, really important in uh, as a compositional tactic in your painting. And lead-ins can be linear, there can actually be a line, and I'm creating a line, a bit of a barrier there, but that will change once I get the fluff, fluff and spot. But you can see I've got this lead-in like this and going round and round. 
And, uh, and so tactically and compositionally, that's a great composition ploy is to have bleedings. They can be linear, they can be in colour, they can be in value. You can use any of those things to create your leadings. Now, I'm going to, I'll finish up in here some of these spots and spots and what's and all the rest of it, except I can't find my colour. Where are you? Sometimes you can put it down and you can never find it again. Um, anyway, we'll use this one instead. Always uh, something else to use. I'm not making it too bright just yet, but I'll play back and forward between these two colours. Is that it? No, that's not it. Is this it? No, that's not it either. Okay, I'll use this one. I'll play back and forward between the types of light. So here we have a mid light, but then I can put on a brighter light, just catching the top of the of the froth there. Uh, so you've got the not quite so bright and a few little touches of light just to cut out the rock soften that up a bit just in there and in here we've got froth and bubble in here let me go over here now because i want to really establish my um what's happening at the base of the um of the big roll, I'm going to include tiny touches of brown because we'd be seeing underneath this sharp, more shallow area, we would be seeing some rock. And so I don't want to make it too dark, but I'll start with this value and then I will cut it up. Also, oh, it's raining. <laughs> also, I just want to take that along in here too. Okay, uh, I'm going to put it on this rock, like so. I'm going to catch the light along there, on there, on there, through here. Ken just informed me it's 10 minutes, so I better speed up. Um, <laughs> and then I'm going to put in uh, with that brown, some of this grey green, it's a nice grey green colour that can break up into some of those sections of froth and bubble. A nice shadow through here, it can dribble over that rock. And then I'm going to come in with my, my and create what I call foam holes. These can be done two ways. They can be done by putting the uh, the roll on top, or then, or or in both ways of coming back and uh, cutting back you know, with your darker values, the little holes back through it. We'll have a few dribbles over that rock, just glazing it off. And as we come into this rock, I'll put um, especially on this side. This will be the lightest value, but we'll have a platform there. Over like so, and then just the light catching on this ridge as it pours over. Mm. Like so, lovely light against that area. This is a little bit dark, so I'll lighten. I'll lighten that up. But see how easy it is just to settle it down. Um, I mean, and you can do that with any media, of course, but the the uh, the beauty of the past dollars is so really quick. And I can put in a bit more there. Little trials, little clicks and clicks. I want this one spraying right up. Over in there, I want some nice spray in here, cutting my rock out. I'm beginning to find the rock. I'll just soften up some of that and get in a little roll along here, along the edge. Like so. Put that in there. 
maybe a touch more green, just cutting that one out, getting that shadow because the roll will cast the shadow. It's a it's a big rolly fluffy thing, and it will cast a shadow. It's got volume, so we want it to have volume. And I can soften all that area there. So I'm focusing in here. You're more likely to focus in the more, uh, of course, not out of focus areas, but the area that's a bit stronger. I will put a, a slightly stronger shadow just through there and then soften it off, smarten up. So we're seeing all kinds of indentations in the in the uh, the wave itself in under here. Right now, coming in to the foreground here, I'll take a uh, lighter blue. What colour shall I use for that? I think I'll bring the blue sky. Bring some of the blue sky down into this area in particular. This is going to be my, a nice puddle reflecting the sky from up there. I need this nice fringe of truck and bubble along here. And you see how I'm creating a length by the length of the pastel creating that, that movement. There's also a uh, light in here, and we can make the nice shadows do their stuff as well. I'm just ticking and flicking. Maybe finding the bottom of the rock just in there, separating that off so it is casting a shadow. Keep the edge soft, the edge is soft. Bit of spray in there as well. And foam trials, foam trials, foam trials. Um, just you've got to work back and forward a little bit, but and given more time, of course, you would, you would refine it. But that's enough. I'm going to take nice wetness through here, through here, deepen it off a bit. So with my bluey grey, I think, or should it be greeny grey? I don't know, maybe a bit of this, a bit of green. That follows in down here. And then we can come in with our water movement. I'll cut out a nice slot around this rock. I love using negative positive spaces. The, the, the negative define the positive. I think it's just so much fun you, and you can pop something out. Okay. You're so negative and so positive. And that's so negative. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's, right. that's exactly right. But isn't it fun, though? Isn't it fun that you can have a mess and then you can cut it up and find <laughs> it? Is and, fun. And find I think you've inspired a lot of people. There's a lot of people in here. It's like, I never saw anybody paint pastel. This is amazing. You guys well, uh, Feel it's that way. Put something in the comments. Pastel, pastels are fun. So, so are oils. Look, I'm a, I'm a, I was always an oil painter first. I was actually a, a landscape painter only in oils for donkey's years, Eric. Um, and then, and then, then my my hairdresser asked me if I would paint a big friend of penny painting for her salon, and I had so much fun with it. That I, that I started up in, you know, in a different direction and rediscovered my love of figurative portraiture and all that stuff and, 
And then I decided I was sick of doing what I was doing in oils um, and uh, tried pastel, and now I go back and forth between the two. Um, if I've got, if I haven't got enough time in hours in the day, if I have to do something else during the day, you know, and I've only got a couple of hours, then I'll go and uh, I'll do pastel for the day. If I've got all day, I'll mix my palette of paint in oil and I'll paint oils all day. Um, so I, I can go, but they're very compatible because you do the same, it's basically the same process of going, um, of going your darks, brights to lights. Um, What's your process? Do you frame this under, under glass? It has to go under glass, yes. Um, I do not use fixative because that, uh, although there are a few fixatives being developed that are a wee touch um, better. But I, I, the, the fact that you're uh, working with, this is pure pigment. It's exactly the same pigment as in oils or watercolour, but you're working with a pure pigment because it's got very little binder in it. Um, and uh, and so it's more actually more color fast than any of the others because of that fact. It's the binder, the oils like linseed, poppy seed, walnut seed, walnuts, not walnut oil, um, that may change color over a period of time. Whereas here we have a pure pigment with very, very little binder in. So therefore, I'm not going to go and put um, fixative in and change its nature anyway. Um, and uh, and so extremely colour fast, beautifully spontaneous, but it does have to go under glass. And um, I'm very conscious. I use a decent quality glass, a museum quality glass, if you if you know if you can afford it, um, because okay, then Lynn, you know, Yep. I'm sorry to interrupt you. You're going to have to put the chalk down, come back on camera, and say goodbye. Oh no! That was really oh, no. Bad. <laughs> I was so close, Eric. Oh, well, you just, you know, your timing, you're, just, you're talking, all you're doing is talking and, and not painting. So what can I tell you? <laughs> <laughs> I was painting away very fast. <laughs> well, you're doing a beautiful job. It's already a masterpiece. Uh, I know you've got a little tweaking you want to do, but it looked fabulous. So, Lynn, thank you so much. Uh, I, I put your information in the chat. Uh, yep. We put information about your upcoming thing and Switzerland in the chat. And thank you. And, and I should mention again, Lynn's going to be, this is rare, that Lynn's going to be at the Plein Air Convention. That's really, really, really cool. I'm so looking forward to seeing you. We became buddies when, when you visited Austin. And then uh, she's going to be on Pastel Live uh, coming up in the fall. And she has in May a new art instruction course coming out through us as Streamline Paint Tube. So we got a lot going on. Lynn, thank you so much today. Oh, look, that's my greatest privilege, Eric. And uh, it's been, and uh, thanks everyone for um, uh, coming in to have a look at what I was doing at 3 a.m. in the morning. I can sleep paint. Um, pastels, a wonderful medium. Painting, wonderful thing to do. Great place to park your brain and uh, enjoy. And thank your camera person. I assume that's your husband. Yes. <laughs> thank you for getting up at three, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning, too. Uh, yeah. You guys give her thumbs up and applause. Lynn Diefenbach, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much, Lynn. I'll thank see you, you in uh, May. Yep, see you in May. Looking forward to it. Can't wait. Yeah, there's no oceans in, in uh, the Smoky Mountains. I know, but that's all right. <laughs> I, I, I like mountains and, and trees and things too. <laughs> I don't right, care as much I'm painting. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Lynn. Okay, right, see you. Bye -bye. Our guest today, Lynn Diefenbach from Australia. Hey, you guys have been very patient. She did a fabulous job. What a masterpiece she created. Reminder to subscribe to this program. If you're new, uh, subscribe and hit the little bell so that you have an opportunity to be reminded when we go live, which is every day, every weekday at 12 noon Eastern time in America. We have people watching from all over the world. Thank you for tuning in. I'm Eric Rhodes. Have a really...
terrific day, and we'll see you tomorrow. Thanks again to Lynn.